Yeah, so I, I, um, you know, I kind of stand here tonight uh, between having uh, gotten to walk three year journey to Indianapolis and the Eucharistic Congress that occurred. Uh, Jimmy should come up here and like show your shirt. He you got this at the Congress. Revival is calling. <laughs> Just great. Jimmy got to be with us in Indianapolis for the Eucharistic Congress that was here in the U.S., the first in 83 years. It was quite a something. Um, and um, and I, so I'm standing here between that occurrence and next week, uh, September 8th to the 15th, um, the International Eucharistic Congress happens in Ecuador. Um, so it's kind of, um, I mean, it's fascinating just in terms of what I wanted to share tonight was just um, how do we live in expectant faith? And part of the reality is, is, is that what occurred in Indianapolis is really that um, we experienced, Jimmy, my husband, anyone who, you know, we almost had 800 people from St. Louis, from the Archdiocese of St. Louis came, which was really one of the largest contingencies of any diocese that actually came to Indianapolis to share in this. Um, but it was a gathering of individuals who came, who all came with an expectancy and an expectancy that the Lord was gonna show up and do something great. And, um, and we all said like, wouldn't it be fascinating if we could all, what everything we went to, you know, we went with such expectancy. Like if tonight you, you had such expectancy in your heart that you came to this, that God called you to this and that because you are here, like God's gonna do something great. Right? So I thought it might be good for us to like, how does that shine through? How, do, how does the, ex, how do we kind of grow in expectant faith? Um, you know, so we know in scripture in uh, Matthew, it says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So here we are, you know, and that was great, Sean, because we're, you know, God's knocking at the door of our hearts for something tonight. That's why you're here. Um, so, you know, we could look at, at the definition in, in like a dictionary for what is expectant faith. What, how does the dictionary define that? It's very fascinating to me because the dictionary actually says that um, to be expectant is to have eager anticipation. So eager anticipation of a strong belief in a supernatural power that controls human destiny. That's actually what the dictionary says is the definition. I think nobody, like, I mean, do we open up the dictionary and we actually... I did. I, I actually, I mean, not just for this, but I mean, like, really, I literally, when our oldest son was born, I don't know why, but um, I sat and read the dictionary to him, like when he was an infant, just from A to Z. I, you know, it was like, I don't know, we were lived in the country. There was that much of it. <laughs> I thought it was, you know, because we lived just a little away from here. And I, I was like, well, what am I going to do with this baby all day? You know, so, you know, he would sleep and I would just read the dictionary to him. So, you know, I learned a lot reading the dictionary, a lot about words, but you know, anyway. <laughs> uh, but I think this is a superb, like honestly, a superb definition of an amazing thing that if we actually embraced what that actually says, an eager anticipation of a strong belief in a supernatural power that controls our destiny. Oh my gosh. Like, number one, did you come here believing that something supernatural was going to happen? Did you come here with an expectancy that God could heal, he could bring something deeper into you? That's supernatural, right? He wants to do that for each and every one of us. 
So expectant faith is a faith that is living and growing in two major things, trust and hope. Trust and hope. So a fervent soul seeks and knocks, as Matthew says. And people were created for God and to have a relationship with God. They seek to hear God's voice through his word. And so this is where it's like, you know, I think a lot of times um, our Protestant brothers and sisters were way ahead of us on this. Like the word was so uh, ingrained in them and the Catholics have run after and kind of caught up on this. But um, I think this has always been in God's design because I think if, if we had already been there, then the, the sacramental life that the, the Catholic Church developed wouldn't have gotten so developed. So I think it's just the way that the, like God's designed for unity, which is, is really the beauty of what we saw at the Congress. Like the Congress brought forth this immense diverse church and we saw unity. Like whether you were Latin Rite, whether you were Sarah Malabar, whether you were Hispanic, whether you were Anglo, it just, it, everyone could come together in unity before our Eucharistic Lord. And that's the amazing thing. Like um, if any of you have ever been part of like, you know, the glo global prayer days that we have in, in St. Louis, the 10 days of prayer. You know, the beauty is, is like when we gather the ecumenical community together and we as Catholics invite them to come to our church, we can sit in adoration together. They love it. They think it's, a, it's the most awesome thing ever. As a matter of fact, I, there's a woman who actually goes to the old cathedral to adoration because she works downtown. She's a Protestant, but her, her invitation to actually go there happened because she was part of a global day of prayer where we invited her to adoration. And she was like, this is awesome. I don't have to join your faith, but this is awesome. I love being in his presence. And she just goes to the old cathedral and sits in his presence. And it's like, you know, this is the unity. This is how we can come together with expectant faith. So in this process of coming and gathering together in anything for with expectant faith, hearts and minds are changed. Um, and that, tra that transformation um, is always oriented towards Jesus Christ, right? We're not being transformed away from Jesus Christ. It's, the transformation is always towards Jesus. Um, and that's what this, because, because it's the supernatural power that comes from him. <clears throat> so um, in the catechism, in uh, number 144, um, it actually tells us that we're supposed to submit freely to the word that has been heard. So Abraham is a great model of this. In hope, he believed against hope, as it says in Romans 4.18. Not only did he have this hope, but he, he knew God as the God of the impossible. Submitting and surrendering everything to him. The Catechism teaches us that Abraham thus fulfills the definition of faith in, in Hebrews. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The Blessed Virgin Mother, so the, I love just everything you, <laughs> you say, you shared, Dominic, because, you know, I mean, it's like the tie-in, because I, I already knew I was going to, like, tie <laughs> the Blessed Mother into this, but the Blessed Virgin Mother is the perfect embodiment of faith. Because after hearing of God's promise from the angel, she is told that with God, nothing is, will be impossible, right? Luke 1, 37. She responded with the yes that echoes to all generations. 
this surrender that she has to the word becomes a way of life for us to follow. And so, you know, with this kind of understanding, so we don't lean on our understanding, but on this kind of understanding, we can grow in faith and are challenged to grow in this expectant faith. This way to believe that the supernatural wants to actually imbue us and be around us. Um, God's not abandoning us. God will speak to us through his living word, right? The word is alive. It's a living word. God will provide for what we need and he desires to hear us, to provide for us and to heal us. There, therefore, we're to approach the throne of grace with confidence. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help and to help in the time of need. So like Dominic knew, like there was a time of need. Man, oh man, that's a lot of things to have happen in a short period of time. But in your time of need, God did not abandon you. He actually gave you the lifeline to actually get through those moments. So how, how, you know, how do we, what do we lean on? How do we lean on the word is to open ourselves really fully to the Holy Spirit. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, bringing about this work of faith. This, this faith is the gift that God gives that is the supernatural virtue that is infused by him. So the Holy Spirit moves the heart and converts it to God and opens the mind and makes it easy for all to accept and believe the truth. How much more should we invoke the Holy Spirit in our lives for this gift of expectant faith? Like, do we do that? Do we actually ask for the Holy Spirit to help us to have more expectant faith? I, I, I kind of purport that no, we don't. <laughs> I don't think we ask for it. So, you know, like why would the Lord say, oh, just here you go. You know, like here's dessert before you eat your vegetables. Because <laughs> here, here you go. <laughs> I just don't think it happens. Because we're supposed to invoke the Holy Spirit and open our lives to his creative work so that we will be the conduits of grace open to a, to a living, expectant faith, where we will be the conduits to that. So Jesus actually encourages us. We actually just celebrated, right, the Feast of St. Monica, you know, and St. Augustine. St. Monica had audacious, shameless audacity right really to just keep praying for her her wayward son she doesn't give up she keeps praying she keeps praying and look what happens to him in his relationship a communal right it's, it's not that god just comes down and changes augustine he he actually he meets ambrose <laughs> right? And they begin this personal relationship where Ambrose introduces him to Jesus. And there's, so it all is about the relationship. And so there's like the communal relationship that is so important for us to actually understand is part of this. So it's not this, like just, I think sometimes people just think, well, um, I'll ask for these things and then that person will just be zapped. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like a zap gun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think of those bug bug machines, you know. <laughs> zap you. <laughs> That's not how it works. It, it's, it really is built on the, the faith of the person, right? But it has to be the right person. So Monica couldn't change Augustine, but Ambrose did. Ambrose was the right person to introduce in relationship to Augustine, this person, Jesus Christ, right? So sometimes our job in expectant faith is to ask for the right person to meet the right, the, the person that we want his heart to be touched, right? So sometimes our job is just to pray in intercession for that 
that relationship to be formed. So um, in Luke 11, 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Persistent prayer is asking God for justice or making known our needs will certainly reach the ears of God because God is generous to all. So I want to just talk about, um, I forgot to ask you, how long do I have? <laughs> okay. okay, I have four keys. What's that? Okay, I have four keys. <laughs> four keys for expectant faith. The first is to foster expectant faith, one must foster a relationship with God yourself. Right? And you must surrender to his lordship. So, you know, the whole idea of using the word of God to get that in your head clearly would be to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be yours as well. That includes incorporating repentance and forgiveness in our lives. Unforgiveness is the biggest obstacle to the receptivity. It's, what, it's one of the walls we build up that keeps our hearts from receiving what the Lord wants to give us. Um, it, it really blocks the way God's gifts can be received. Um, surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus is also surrendering our bitterness and our resentments that hold us bound. So that's the first key. The second key is to pray fervently for the Holy Spirit. So it's like Sean read my mind or something. Like his songs were, I was like, wow, I didn't even talk to him. <laughs> But the Holy Spirit did. <laughs> so that was awesome. <laughs> so pray fervently, invoking the Holy Spirit to prepare your heart to receive the Word of God. To receive the Word of God. So that when the Lord speaks, because the Lord does speak, we're not listening, but the Lord does speak. And we have to prepare our hearts to hear when the Lord speaks so that what we can respond we can respond wholeheartedly for the word of god i love this scripture it's from hebrews 4 12. for the word of god is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joint and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart Right? I think sometimes people think they can do something and their hearts cannot be engaged and no one will know. It's not true. But people know. <laughs> people know when people's hearts are far from what they're doing. Right? So um, the word of God really is the sword of the spirit. And it's, we set our hearts on fire for the love of God because the Holy Spirit will purify, sanctify everything that we're doing, everything that we're saying. Okay, so you got the first key. What is it? The walls. Forgiveness. And resentment. Right, so it's a relationship with God. And we have to lay down those things that are the walls. The second key? The Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit in the world. What the third key? What? <laughs> Just trying to help you. <laughs> the third key would be to actually read Scripture. Be people who read Scripture and expect God to speak to them through the Word. For God to speak through the Word. All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in high righteousness. Second Timothy. Chapter 3, verse 16. <laughs> if you really want to look that up. <laughs> um, you know, there are, there are other reading materials that can complement that. But scripture, I mean, it's like you can't go wrong 
with the word of God to speak to you first. And then you can seek other reading material that can help deepen that, but you should start with how the word of God is, is moving you first. Like, is it rooted in that first? Because I think sometimes there are people who read lots of books and they come to me and they say, I'm so disturbed by all of this. And it's like, well, did the Lord actually ask you to read any of those things? Like, was it rooted in any word you got from the Lord? Well, no. It's like, well, then stop reading it. <laughs> You know, it's the Bob Newhart. Stop it. Just stop it. Stop reading it. <laughs> Just don't read it. <laughs> so, so the fourth key would be once we receive the word of God, there is a call and expectation to respond. So just as Abraham became the father of faith and the Blessed Virgin became the perfect embodiment of faith, Mary questioned, how can this be? Honest questioning, this is a really important point. Honest questioning is not a faithless response. Too often people think, well, I shouldn't question that. Well, Mary questioned, how can this be? <laughs> I think that's a fair question, right? And that doesn't make her faithless. It just was a fair question. And then affirm the greatness of God. She questioned, and God actually answered and convicted in her heart. And what did she, how, did, how was her response? It was the Magnificat, right? The greatness of God. So responding to the word of God is the equivalent of God's expectation of us. As God's expectation of you and I is our response. So there are tons of scriptures that talk about expectant faith. And I could list them all, but I won't. <laughs> because I actually wanted to do one other thing and Sean's gonna come up. Um, this, is, this is instead of my questioning questions, we're gonna do um, a healing thing. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay.
Pope Francis chose was um, fraternity will heal the world. So the fraternity of the Eucharist will heal the world. And so I um, just came up with this, like just a process for you to use um, to be aware of the, of the Lord's love flowing first from the wounds of Jesus. So you might just close your eyes and just identify your desire for healing. And it could be a cold, it could be a stubbed toe, it could be anything. It could be a hurt feeling. But identify that desire for healing and tell him what it is. At every Eucharist, when you ask to be healed, you're actually asking Jesus to take one drop of his precious blood to flow through your system. And in receiving his body to heal your system, your whole body, your whole mind, and your whole spirit, and any specific healing you are in need of at that moment. now one of those keys was about the presence of the Holy Spirit so you're going to ask the Holy Spirit what memory or experience or need you have right now he desires to heal for you Jesus into those feelings or the memory and watch what he says or does. as long as he is active.
thank him for his powerful presence. to your experience. So you may need to ask yourself, what, what am I feeling? And try to stay in the experience. experience with Psalm 3410. For those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. For those who seek the Lord, they lack no good thing. So I think that if we're going to spend some time in conversation, I think the conversation could be around what you experienced and I think the conversation could be around where which of those four keys um, do you have the most difficulty engaging so that you can grow in expected faith. 